The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. I'm the chief. I'm the chief marketing officer of Silence, uh, and I'm here to present to you our Silence overview and demo from Black Hat. Many of you came by our booth, and we want to thank you very much for doing so. And if we didn't get a chance to demonstrate our product and the power of math today in this presentation, we'd like to be able to do so. So for the, about the next 30 minutes, I'm going to turn this over to Braden Russell, our Senior Vice President of Engineering, who will be taking care of the, the product overview. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Hopefully, you did get a chance to stop by and talk to somebody while you were at Black Hat. And if not, uh, great to have you on the, on the call today on the webinar. And we're going to walk through a little bit about kind of how Silence got going, why we started to do what we did, and then drive, drive right into the math behind what we're building and what we've built. So again, like Greg said, I'm Braden Russell, uh, head of product development at Silence. And we're going to talk about next generation endpoint protection. So how did it all start? We started with the, the key tenants at the bottom of the screen that hopefully you can all see now. Let machines do the work, make decisions based on math, not based on human interaction, but let's let machines do what machines do well and make decisions for us. And what it comes down to really is um, you know, kind of sitting around talking about software security. And you know, most of the security people you talk to and you ask them, what do you run on your computer? A lot of them will tell you nothing. I don't run anything. There's usually two reasons for that. One is it's just I don't like the performance of it. And the second is I'm smart enough to know what to click on. I don't click on the wrong links. I don't open the wrong attachments. I don't click on the wrong EXEs. And so I don't need it. It doesn't help me at all. Well, if that's the case, if we as security industry individuals can make those decisions for ourselves, why can't we train computers to make that same decision? Why can't we make computers smart enough to know what should run and shouldn't run and make, have the machines make those decisions instead of leaving it up to an endpoint user on desktop or laptop who may not have the same background or experience as a security professional? So we put to work uh, actuarial algorithmic science, get high accuracy, low cost. We use machine learning to analyze malware and to build a model that allows us to predict whether or not something that, when it wants to run, is going to be malicious or not. Now, some of what you heard is that, you know, we didn't invent the science, we just made it better. Uh, there are many companies out there that are using machine learning and a lot of the same techniques that we use to analyze malware for other things. So it's been in use in the insurance industry forever, actuarial science, actuarial tables, how do you get your insurance policy is all based on this big data, large analytic analysis. Google, of course, uses it. Uh, Netflix may be one of the most famous machine learning uh, companies out there for sponsoring machine learning algorithm contests. And of course, if you've got a Siri or an Xbox or uh, Microsoft's new Cortana or you use Google Live uh, or Google Now, I apologize, uh, you're using a machine learning based product. So we've taken the learning that these companies have put in and invested into cybersecurity to uh, help your computer and those are the, the uh, endpoint users you're trying to protect to make the right decisions. Because like it or not, although we may know what to click on, there are people out there who will just click on anything and everything. And you get a, a new EXE that shows up in your email with a cool name on it that looks like something fun or looks like you're going to get some money from somewhere, of course you're going to click on that, right? Well, unbeknownst to you, that's going to do something bad in the background start stealing your information or, or otherwise do harm to your computer. And if your computer was smart enough to know, hey, you shouldn't run this, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. You just let the computer make that decision and we can eliminate the victimization entirely. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we start with uh, the file types that we support currently, which are PE files. And it's the EXE, DLL, SIS, those files on the, on the, the far left of the screen. And we're scaling this technology out to support more file types, PDF, docs, Java files, uh, Swifts, and the like. And what we do is we'll take those files and extract them out into their characteristics. So what makes that file uniquely that file? And there are over 4 million different features or characteristics that we can look at on any given file. Now, no file has 4 million. Files will have less than that. But across the millions of samples that we've analyzed, 
we found four million different unique characteristics that uniquely describe a file. So as we pull those out, we start to analyze, well, what makes this piece of software unique? What makes it uh, do what it does? And then we start to build models where we train on the good files and the bad files so that we know how are the good files built and how are the bad files built. What comes out of that is essentially a model that allows us to predict. So any file that we see on an endpoint that wants to execute, we can run it through our model. And that model really becomes almost like a malware processor, a software-based processor that we add to the endpoint. And it's a, a little decision-making engine that will allow that computer to make decisions on files and whether or not they should execute. And so we call it a math model because it is purely math on the inside. But really, you can think of it as a software-based processor. So it's a malware processor. You know, add it to your computer just like you'd add any other, you know, a graphics processor or you know, a sound processor. This is a malware processor that allows you to feed any file into it, and it'll produce an output for you of good or bad and a confidence value. So what happens is each of those samples becomes a unique value. A unique value. We build a matrix out of those. And out, the output of that matrix is this is good or this is bad. So this looks like what we've uh, determined to be malicious software, or this looks like what we've determined to be safe software. And the computer then basically is allowed to make its own decision. Run the safe, block the bad, without ever having seen anything before. So there's no signatures, there's no heuristics, there's no behavior. We don't have to let it run and let someone be victimized in order to block it. It's purely done before execution based on mathematical analysis and running it through that processor. So what we've done is we've taken that same technology and built it into an endpoint technology uh, that we call next generation endpoint protection. And this is what we believe endpoint protection would have been had we had this technology back, you know, when we started the early days of blacklisting 30 years ago with uh, guys in floppy disks running around in vans. And if they had the hash on their floppy disk, they could protect you from it on your computer or they could find it and get rid of it. If they didn't have the hash, well, they couldn't help you. But once they found it that you had been victimized, they could get your hash and go help everyone else. Still the same way that blacklists work today. Once someone gets victimized, we can add it to a DAT file, we can add it to a blacklist and protect others. But if no one's ever seen it before, first one to see it or the first few to see it are all victims. With our technology, there's no victims. No one has to be sacrificed uh, because it doesn't matter if it's, there's a signature for it or not. The mathematical analysis of that sample will be the same. So you can think of it, um, you can grow a mustache from November. You look like a different person, but deep down on the inside, you're still the same. So you can take any file and make it a little bit different. It may have a different hash, may have a different signature, may get through a DAT file, but deep down on the inside, it's still the same. So when it's analyzed by the math, it still comes out the same. So what we get with this technology is high performance. So it's dynamic scan avoidance. We use execution control. We can use whitelisting where needed, uh, but it's all based on execution control and it's purely run through the math algorithm. It's very fast and very efficient. Um, we have the advanced threat detection based on mathematical modeling. It is context aware, so it'll give you information on the OS, the application, uh, we have additional data available to you in the console that will open in a minute that provides network access for the samples if it were to run. If you, you know, if it was to execute what it would have done, files, registry changes, uh, process execution. In addition to protecting against threats that show up on the endpoint, we also have a memory defense technology for pure in-memory attacks. This is the DLL injection, heap spray, those attacks where nothing ever actually hits the disk to execute. Now, typically those are used to drop something on disk so you can get persistence, but not always. But uh, we have a memory protection capability that will run and protect any of your running uh, known good processes from being tampered with. Uh, it is installed resilient with self-protection, and it is very flexible. We have a cloud-based management console. All of our components are independently updatable on the endpoint. Updates are, are infrequent, they're rare. We don't have daily content updates. Updates come out uh, infrequently. Our last math model came out in April and has been working and running and doing a great job the whole time that's been out there, uh, protecting our customers from new and unknown, previously unknown malware uh, from day one. 
or from day zero actually, or day minus one to be honest with you. So advanced threat protection, these are the three pieces. We have execution control, this prevents all threatening binaries from running. This is a configurable option, but uh, we tend to see our customers move into execution control as quickly as possible. Uh, this is the set it and forget it, don't let anything bad run, and I know I'm good. So instead of inventing a better smoke detector, we're preventing the fire from ever starting. Memory defense runs on top of that to prevent apps from being exploited in memory. And we also have the ability to do full disk scanning and file monitoring for those computers that you need to know on all of the deep dark recesses of every attached drive in that device that it's totally clean. Now there could be malware sitting on a drive somewhere. It doesn't really become a threat until someone clicks on it and it runs. Uh, so that's when execution control would kick in. But if for compliance or for audit reasons, you need to have verification that this system is entirely clean, you can do full disk scanning and file monitoring to, to prove that as well. So how does execution control work? We have an agent that hooks into the kernel when it's installed and immediately begins to monitor binary execution. So the first thing it'll do is look at everything that's currently running or loaded, make sure that none of those are threats, and then from that point forward, any application attempts to launch, it is classified through the malware processor through that math model. If it's a threat, it's blocked. If it's a safe file, it's allowed. So it works very much like a blacklist solution on the endpoint without needing a blacklist. It also works very much like a whitelist solution on the endpoint without needing to maintain a whitelist. All the good files can run, all the bad files are blocked with, uh, without any user interaction. And then the memory defense, which sits on top of that, is uh, for protecting known good applications and pre preventing them from being exploited in memory. It is designed to complement existing Microsoft technologies like EMET and ASLR. And memory defense techniques that we use are signature lists, but they are behavioral. So we watch for certain key indicators of malicious activity within a process. And when that occurs, the uh, injected code is run through our memory defense to be verified. If it is an allowable change, we ignore it, we let it go. If it's an illegitimate change to that process, it can be blocked. Uh, it can be reported on, not blocked, but simply reported on or we can terminate the process entirely to prevent any future attempts at, at attack. So that is a high level overview of what we've built. And from this point, I'd like to jump into a demo of the Silence Console to show you uh, how it shows up in, in the real world once you install it and get it running, what it looks like. Let me pull that up real quick. So this is your silence console. Once you log in, you're greeted with a dashboard showing you all of your devices and threats that you have across your entire organization. Now, because it's cloud-based, the devices don't need to be behind the firewall to be protected or for you to know what's going on. Someone takes their laptop home, they plug it into their home network and it gets infected, you know about it right away. Someone takes their laptop to a hotel on travel, they take it around the world to a country that you know you may not be uh, too uh, familiar with. Something happens to that computer, it gets infected, you know about it immediately. Before they bring it back to the corporate network and plug it back in, you already know it's infected. Starbucks, it gets hacked, it gets infected, you know about it before they bring it back to the office and plug it in. So what we're seeing here is that this account, which is a, a silence demo account, has a total of 353 unique devices that are being managed. Uh, and this is scalable, it's cloud-based, so it's scalable up to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of devices. Total number of files that have been analyzed across all those devices, 14 million files, and, and currently, we're only looking at the executable files on the system. So we're, we're still expanding our math models to support documents and Java files and Swifts and others, but currently this is 14 million different executable files uh, across those 353 devices see that 58 unsafe files have been reported. So these are files on devices that aren't currently auto-blocking or auto-quarantining threats. 
and 18 of those are unique to silence. So 18 of those are files that are being detected by silence as malware that aren't being detected by the tier one AV industry. So if you have AV out there, these are the files that you know it's missing uh, that it should be telling you about that it maybe isn't. And down here, we, this is our protection status. So we have a set of files that have been quarantined, some files that have been waived, which means that uh, they've been allowed to run on individual devices. So they may not be allowed across the, the whole corporate environment, but on certain devices they've been allowed. And this happens a lot of times with tools that can be used maliciously, but in the right hands are, are fine. Tools like PSExec, which uh, for an IT professional or a security professional might be something you need to do your job every day, but for uh, an average endpoint user, if they have PSExec on their system, may be an indication that there's other APT activity going on, or it's just not safe to have it there in the event that an attack takes place. And then we have 59 files that are unsafe. So these are the files I need to go take a look at and figure out what I should do with these. Should I quarantine them? Are they allowed for the people that uh, have them? Or uh, should I otherwise remove them? I have one file, I think. If I look down in this little section here. I have one file, my global quarantine. So my global quarantine are those threats that I know are bad across the board. And no matter who sees them or where they're seen, I don't need to do a, a, an analysis on them. I don't need to do an incident response. I just know this thing is straight up bad. Block it anywhere you see it. That's the files that are in my global quarantine. Over here, the threats by priority. This allows you to, to prioritize how you go about these uh, 57 files that are unsafe. And what happens is, as we analyze a threat, when we detect it, we give it a priority based on the device it's running on, so you can set devices to be high priority devices, based on whether or not it's actually running right now. So if it's running, it's going to be higher priority, or if it has ever run, meaning it has done some damage potentially in the past, or if it's configured to auto run. So on the next reboot, it's going to start up and it'll run and do some damage. Those all elevate the priority of that threat. Uh, and in addition, a very high silent score. So a silent score that says we are very confident that this file is malicious will also raise your priority. So my next step is then to drill down into the unsafe files. If I take a look at these, I clicked on the wrong area there. There we go. So this shows me a list of all of the unsafe files that have been reported across my organization. The silent score is our confidence in how uh, confident the math is that this is a malicious file. 94, it's a 0 to 100. 94 is a very high, very confident, very confident score. Uh, and an 8 is a lower confidence score. So you see it's a lower priority. This is something that I'd want to look at eventually, but it may not bubble up to the top of my list. In addition to showing you what silence has found about these files, we'll show you whether or not it's signed. Now, uh, many of you out there are probably seeing the same trends that we're seeing, that there's a lot of signed malware. We've seen uh, malware show up with good, valid signatures. Most of this stuff that I'm seeing here is not signed. And we also show you what the AV industry thinks about that file. So the AV industry is calling this one safe. And this is the, the tier one AV industry. So uh, you're kind of looking at those tier one big time enterprise AV industry players. You may see as we click out to this, in fact, let's take a look at this one. As we click out to this one, there are a handful of uh, AV vendors that are calling this bad. They agree with the math detection that this is malicious. So Bit Defenders in there, uh, Fortinet, Icarus are, are in there. But um, as you scroll down, you'll notice that there are a lot of players, Kaspersky, Malwarebytes, Microsoft, McAfee, Symantec, Trend, uh, that are not detecting this one. So they don't have a signature for this file. Now, we can do a little more analysis on it. And I'll show you that in our console. But if these are correct, you know, if this is a dropper, if these guys have it right, then the math is blocking you, even though everyone else thinks this file is just fine. And if you've got any of these AV vendors, they're letting it run in your environment and uh, have no problem with it. 
So what we see here are the devices where it has is still unsafe, so it hasn't been dealt with yet. This is the zone that that device is in. So it's in the finance zone. Might be something I want to take a look at right away. I have some places where the file has already been detected and quarantined. So you know, a couple of admin devices and an engineering device that's already been quarantined there. It gives me a pretty good indication. I probably want to quarantine it for this one as well. Here's our overview. Uh, product information. This is a pretty good indicator that there's something wrong with this software. Legitimate software vendors, Microsoft, Adobe, Silence, others, put product names and descriptions and copyrights in their software. They also sign them. And then you also get some stats down below on uh, what has happened with that file across other Silence customers. So you see that 100% uh, of the other Silence customers have blocked this file. It's a pretty good indicator that it, it should be blocked in your environment as well. So we can drill a little bit deeper on this one. And I get all of that same information here that was presented on the last screen. These are the affected devices and zones. And I can also take a look at detailed threat data. So when the file is submitted to Silence for analysis, we run it also through, for supplemental data, we run it through a sandbox to um, just provide a little more context about the file. The sandbox doesn't generate any kind of uh, decision for us. It's not used to make a decision on whether or not the file is good or bad. It just provides additional context. So if you're in an auto block mode and you're blocking malware from running using silence, this gives you an indication of what that software may have done had you allowed it to run. If you're not in an auto blocking mode and, and you're letting the malware run, you're just alerting on it, silence is telling you that new malware has been found, this gives you an indication of what it probably did when it ran uh, and maybe should have been blocked. And we're not getting a lot of information out of this one. Doesn't look like it's doing much. So we'll see if we can find a better one. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, within your organization, you can divide all of your endpoints up into different zones. And you can zone them based on geographic location, based on the function of the device, based on the criticality of the device. So within a zone, I can set the priority or the value for the, the devices in that zone. So I may have several PCI devices that span across engineering, IT, and finance. I can create a specific PCI zone, say that these are high value, so that if any malware shows up in the PCI zone, I know I need to take care of it right away. Then you also have all of your devices. So you can take a look at the devices. You can see when they last communicated, when they were added to the system, the number of threats on those devices, all these columns are filterable and sortable, and what policy is applied to that device, and we'll look at policies next. So I'll just open up any, any one of these policies to walk through what the options are. Now, within uh, the file actions, you have the ability for any executable file that's found, that's scanned, if it's determined to be unsafe by silence, you can auto-quarantine it, which means it won't be allowed to run, and it'll automatically move to a quarantine safe location on that system, and uh, will not present uh, any harm to that end user, or you can simply alert on it. So if I turn off auto-quarantine, I will get an alert in my console that new malware was detected or that new malware ran, but it wasn't blocked. It wasn't, uh, there was no interaction taken by silence. This auto-upload option, enables you to automatically submit files to Silence that Silence hasn't seen before for analysis, and that provides all that additional rich context, allows us to run it in the sandbox and present that information to you, um, and give you all of that additional contextual information about that sample. This only uploads executable files, doesn't up upload anything proprietary, no documents, no PDFs, uh, it's only executable files, and they're uploaded to an anonymous and secure location uh, within our cloud so that uh, they are never shared, uh, they're never given to anyone else, anything that you upload is all safe and protected, uh, and it's actually anonymous, so it's, it's, uh, we don't store actually who uploaded those files at all. Um, and these are good options to leave on. 
because that additional contextual information is very valuable. Uh, and then if you're in a, an environment where you want to just keep them completely locked down, it's a call center, uh, it's an environment that you know should never change, you shouldn't get new software on it, you can block files that sound completely abnormal. Now, these are files that have anomalies in them in the way they're constructed or the way they're built. They look to us to be potentially malicious, but the map didn't have high enough confidence to, to clearly call them unsafe. Um, these are files that typically we'll look into uh, and, and analyze to determine you know, whether or not we can, as individuals, raise the confidence in that detection. Um, or occasionally there will be files in there that are suspicious but safe in your environment that you can then just add to your safe list and silence will ignore from that point on. The memory actions, this is where we can enable or disable memory protection. The memory protection can be enabled and can alert on any of the uh, different attack types that we protect against. You can block the attack or you can terminate the process. Blocking the attack stops it from occurring the one time but uh, whatever's injecting into memory may continue to try to do the same attack, in which case it will be just be blocked over and over and over again. Uh, to fully end that attack entirely, you can terminate the process. And then for protection settings, this is the full disk scan. So if you have a system or a set of systems that you want to know uh, everywhere on that system, on every attached drive, whether or not any malware exists, you can turn on the full disk scan. Full disk scans are optimized for performance, which means they run in the background almost in an indexing mode to where they, they do not interfere with the user interaction on the, the device itself. They'll run slowly, crawl all the drives looking for malware, uh, and then we'll report that back as they find any. But the intent there is for the software to live up to the name and to be silent so that even if you're running a full disk scan or you're watching for new files that arrive on that system, the user won't see any negative performance impact on their device. So how does this show up in the real world? Well, let me just show you really quickly how it showed up for me not long ago. So it was about two months ago and this email showed up in my inbox. This email from supposedly from Bank of America uh, although I don't know Owen, and uh, Bank of America sh assures me that Owen doesn't work there. Uh, Owen believes that he does work at Bank of America, and uh, he wanted to um, transfer about $6,200 to me, which is awesome. Who doesn't want $6,200, right? Well, again, as security professionals, we know, okay, well, this is suspicious. I'm not going to open this attachment, right? But there may be someone out there in your corporate environment who, you know, has a corporate desktop or laptop who gets this email. This did come in to my corporate email account. This came into my silence email account. And they may say, wow, 6,200 bucks? I wonder where that came from. Let me open up this attachment and see what's going on. You know, maybe, uh, maybe my dad all of a sudden got generous and wanted to give me some money. Who knows? So I was to, uh, if I was to open up this zip and double click on the SCR file, it you know, calls itself a screensaver, which is a little bit funky considering it's supposed to be an, a, a fund transfer. Uh, it's a screensaver, and it is genu genuinely very, very malicious. So what I did when I got it was, oh, hey, I know this is malicious. I'm never going to double-click it, but let's see what silence says. So I did pull it out, and I threw it onto a virtual machine that I have. I can pull that virtual machine up real quick. And I threw that sample on here, and I had it in an auto block policy. So you'll see that here's that electronic fund transfer.scr file was automatically quarantined because the math picked it up as malicious, automatically quarantined it. So before I even had the chance to run it, I just wanted to look at it. It moved it away and said, this thing's going to cause you harm. I'm going to quarantine it and not allow it to run. So what did that look like for the uh, security administrator or the IT administrator in the console. Well, just so happens that we have that here as well. So let's go find that VM. Here it is right here. 
and within my quarantine files, I see that electronic fund transfer. And you'll see that we have a silent score of 90, very high score, very highly indicative of this being a threat. Now, the AV industry actually has caught up. And it, it's interesting to, to watch how this changes over time. But uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more as we pull into virus total for this one. 100% um, of the users in Silence Demo have quarantined this so that across my organization it's blocked everywhere. 88.9% of all Silence users that have seen this file have blocked it as well. Uh, we have Silence users who are our research team internally who probably haven't blocked it, which is what's skewing this number a little bit. But uh, odds are that all real world customers that have seen this file have also quarantined it. So what I get when I look at, so this is everywhere that it's shown up. For me, it's only on this one device. What I get with the detailed threat data is a rich amount of information about what this file would have done had I let it run on that VM. These are the files that were dropped. So an auto exec batch file, an additional exe file, and we can take a look at analysis of this. This file hasn't been found in virus total, so I'm going to need to get that one. And what it did on the network, you see where it reached out to, trying to get to these domains, uh, and otherwise behavior, the files that it looked at or otherwise attempted to modify registry keys that it was interested in. Now this one can be very, very enlightening. When you look at the registry keys, you can see a lot of times you'll see them, the malware search through for all of the different known virtual environments. So you'll see looking for VMware and VirtualBox and other virtual environments, and all of a sudden it'll hit one and just be done. And it'll realize, oh, I'm running in a virtual environment and stop. And those are what we're referring to now as sandbox aware malware, um, where it can bypass the sandbox by knowing that it's running in a VM, but it doesn't bypass the math. We still get the same score against it because it's not based on behavior. It's based on how that file is constructed. So now taking a look at this one and what the AV industry thinks about this file, you'll see that everybody's got it now. Everybody's got it now. But back two months ago, when that email came in, let me pull that email up again. So this email came in two months ago. It was in early June. This list was empty. It was totally, totally empty. So the first few people that got that email and clicked on the, the attachment, they got infected. Now they're safe. A couple months later, everyone's safe. But, well, almost everyone is safe. But two months ago they weren't. So if we look at additional information, this file first showed up uh, on 6-2, which is the same day I got the email. So someone else got the email and they submitted the virus total. And this list was totally empty. Now it's grown over time as these vendors have been able to do their analysis and add the signature to their DAT files. Uh, but when it, was first, when it was first emailed out, it wasn't anywhere. Silence caught it because it was purely mathematical. We didn't have to have a signature for it, but none of these others did. And they're doing a good job keeping up to date. Within two months, most of them have it. But the next one that comes out tomorrow that they don't have a signature for, they won't be able to block until eventually they get around to putting a signature together for it. However, Silence, using the math, using that processor on the endpoint, is able to find it, block it, and keep you safe from it without ever having seen it before. And last thing I want to show you is user management. And this is where you can create users within your account. And you can have administrators who essentially are uh, able to do anything and everything within the system. Then you can have users and uh, zone managers that are defined within a zone. So if you have a zone of devices for an office in New York or a zone of devices for an office in Florida, you can assign a user who's responsible for those devices to only that zone. They have the ability to log in, to check the, the security uh, posture of the devices in the zone they have access to, but not to the rest of your devices. They don't have access to the devices in San Jose or Toronto. Uh, 
the zone manager for a zone is able to change policy uh, for the devices in the zones that they have access to and do a little bit more configuration within that zone, but uh, they don't have access to all devices. That's left to the administrator. So you have the ability to create all of your users as administrators. They can get to anything and everything, or you can use role-based access control to drill it all the way down to limiting access to just the information that's needed for that endpoint user. And at this point, I'd like to open it up. I haven't seen any questions come across on the, the chat unless I missed it. But um, Ryan, if we could open it up for questions. Check again. Oh, okay, so we do have a question on how do you protect against CryptoLocker? So this is a great question. So CryptoLocker was one of those samples that uh, we have a, a customer who everyone has war wounds, right? Everyone has that outbreak that occurred. Someone clicked on that uh, fund transfer and that malware spread across their environment. There wasn't a signature in the DAT for it. They had to get emergency DATs. They worked all weekend. They were unplugging devices. They were re-imaging devices, and it was a mess. For one of our customers, that was CryptoLocker. CryptoLocker was, you know, kind of their most recent war wound. And what we found with the variant of CryptoLocker that they had was that there was a signature for it, uh, in some of the AV vendors' DAT files, but not all. And unfortunately, they had an AV vendor that didn't have a signature for this one, and they weren't protected. Now, uh, the great thing about the math is that all of those variants of CryptoLocker all look the same to the algorithm. So it doesn't matter if you take one variant of CryptoLocker, make it slightly different so it can bypass all the DATs, and ship it out again, to the math, it's still going to look the same. So we have a very, very high detection rate against CryptoLocker for two reasons. One is that we've been able to train against a ton of CryptoLocker samples, and we have those included in our training sets for how we build the math models. And another is that those CryptoLocker variants, as they grow, the files themselves, the underlying core of the files themselves, don't change that much. They, they're slightly tweaked uh, to bypass traditional blacklist security measures, but they look the same and they look malicious in the same ways as the existing CryptoLocker files. And the next question is, does this need to be updated like AV? And the answer is absolutely not. So that's the, the beauty of the math model. And if you look at uh, the three uh, core tenants that we built the software, that we built the endpoint protection to address, one is detection effectiveness. Are we really finding everything that we should be finding? So we know that um, the traditional blacklist security measures that are out there in the wild, you know, a large blacklist vendor recently announced that endpoint is dead. Uh, we don't believe endpoint's dead. We believe that endpoint just needs to be done correctly. But the old ways of doing endpoint, that keeping up with signatures, probably is dead. It probably needs to, to go the way of the dodo and move on because there's just no way, even with the armies of researchers and analysts that are building DAT files, there's just no way to keep up with the, the amount of attacks that are coming out. So that's why DATs have to be updated every day. Uh, our math model is one mathematical processor that gets added to the system that gets updated infrequently and once it's in place, can analyze files, doesn't matter if it's seen them before or not, and gives you a result for those files. So our last, what would kind of be considered a content update, our last mass processor update occurred in April. We'll probably do another one this month or next month as we build our next generation model technology. Uh, but you're talking about months of time between what would essentially be the equivalent of a data update. Instead of getting a daily data update, you're talking about waiting you know, months in between those updates. In addition to that, the math model itself, the processor itself, is very, very small, much smaller than a typical DAT file. Uh, the current math model is uh, less than 40 megs, and, it, you know, you get that once every few months, let's say, which is uh, the, kind of the exact opposite of getting a new 100 meg DAT file every day from AV. And do you integrate into SIM? Absolutely, we do integrate into SIM. 
So we have SIM integration right now via syslog. And in fact, I think I still have it up. I can show you that right now. Uh, if I go to application settings, I can integrate via syslog into SIM. These are the supported options for SIM in our current sprint that will ship later this month. We're adding three or four more uh, supported endpoints for SIM, including um, McAfee and, and a few others, Nitro and a few others. Uh, so we do integrate with SIM, and, and that integration is essentially via syslog. How does, uh, okay, so the next question is, how does this scale with environments with thousands of endpoints? Great question. So uh, there's two ways that it helps with scalability. The first is that the console, the management console, is in the cloud. So we essentially have infinite compute resources available to us in the cloud to scale to any size uh, that's required. We have customers that are in the thousands, deploying into the tens of thousands, uh, and working on closing uh, into the hundreds of thousands uh, soon. And essentially, the, the, what makes it more scalable for the, the traditional enterprise is that you don't have to manage the hardware infrastructure associated with the back end for the system. So what tends to happen where you, hear, where you get your scalability choke points with the traditional on-premise system is your database fills up. Uh, you have too many connections into a single server, a single point of failure. So you have to create a manager of managers scenario where you have sub-managers that all report up to a centralized manager console and you have to deploy this all out yourself and it all has to work you know, and you have to get all the IT infrastructure and the firewall rules correct. And all of that is eliminated because the console, the database, the scalability is all handled by us, by our operations and IT team in the cloud in the back end. So as long as the endpoints can at some point make an HTTPS connection to the Internet, they are fully manageable. Now, they don't need an Internet connection to be protected. They can run disconnected from the internet, and should someone plug in a USB or otherwise sneaker net malware onto a system, it's fully protected because that math model runs local and does local analysis of the files there. But at some point, almost like a store and forward, that device will make a connection to the network, which will give them an HTTPS connection out to the internet that report those results of you know, what either you know, tried to run or what ran or what infections occurred, and that will all show up in your security console. And the next question is, will this replace AV, or is it another tool that works with AV? So there's, that's a, a two-part answer for that one. The first is that it is designed and tested to be fully functional with, a dish, uh, with existing protection technologies that you already have in place. It will work as an additional layer of protection uh, right next to whatever you've already got deployed and it will catch all the additional threats that that existing technology that you have deployed isn't catching. So it gives you better visibility into the endpoint, it gives you better visibility into the malware that's running on the endpoint, and it also gives you a higher rate of the detection effectiveness. Now beyond that, depending on the needs and the use cases for a particular device or set of devices, it may be entirely possible to eliminate AV from that device and run silence only. Uh, if it's not possible to eliminate AV entirely, uh, running silence does allow you to pull back some of the protections that you were running in that AV to give yourself a little bit of performance back on that device. So you can start pulling back the policies that are in place for that AV, pull it back to the, the bare minimum of what you need it there for, let silence cover everything else, and give yourself a little more breathing room in the memory in the processor. And next question is, what data is sent to the cloud? Our organization is concerned with cloud-based technologies. Yeah, uh, we hear that quite often. So there's two different pieces of information that are sent to the cloud. Um, one is essentially just the devices and the malware found on those devices. That's reported into your cloud management console, and um, it is secured. We internally pen test that with using our own security staff on a routine basis. Um, and it is protected. Customer data is isolated from other customer data, but really what's being reported are the devices and the malware on those devices. Then the second layer of information that's optional to be reported 
are the, the files themselves. So if we happen to come across a file uh, on an, an endpoint in your environment that we've never seen before, you can optionally submit that to Silent. Um, and unless you're in the case where you're building your own software, most of those EXEs are not yours anyways. They're EXEs that have come to you from another vendor or from a download or from somewhere else. Submitting them to Silent isn't anything proprietary. Again, we do keep them protected and safe and anonymous, uh, but that's the second level of information that can potentially be passed to Silent, and that allows us to give you that full, rich contextual information about that file when we report it. It looks like that wraps it up for questions. Um, let's, uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we can wrap it up for today. I really want to thank all of you for joining the webinar today. Appreciate you taking the time. And uh, hopefully you did get a chance to meet one uh, or a few of us at Black Hat. If not, we look forward to seeing you at the next conference uh, where we may be able to run into you and get a chance to shake your hand and talk to you in person. If you need additional information, you would like to start a POC with Silence, we'd love to get you involved with kicking the tires and, and uh, you pull out that war wound that you have, that uh, malware sample that your AV didn't catch that you had to work all weekend to block, and we'd love to see you throw it at Silence and have us block it and show you that, you know, had we been there back then, we would have had you protected. So thank you for joining. If you'd like any more information, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can send an email or just go to our website and all that contact information will be a follow-up to this webinar. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.